Hi, Dr. Centeno, and uh, thanks for joining us today. I am going to try something new today. Uh, seems like this uh, program I'm using to live stream uh, called StreamYard is so good that I'm going to take it up a notch. And uh, today I'm going to live stream to three channels, uh, the Centeno Schultz Facebook page, the Regenix Facebook page, and my own personal YouTube channel. Uh, so this should be appearing on all three. I don't know if it really is. I'll check that after I'm done. Uh, but should be interesting to see if it works. If it does, that's pretty cool. Uh, so let's start first with today's topic, and that is how do we get to a CCI diagnosis or craniocervical instability diagnosis? I know that I have talked about that many times, but I want to make sure everyone understands it because sometimes I meet patients that have seen these videos and they're still not sure how we get there. So there's four different components uh, for me to get to a craniocervical instability diagnosis. Uh, the first part uh, is imaging. And uh, there's lots of different things we look for on imaging, as we've discussed here. And I'm happy to answer questions about that again. Uh, but the second part is, is there a reason for this person to have craniocervical instability? Meaning, uh, has there been enough trauma to uh, allow that to happen? Uh, and then the, the next part of that would be, uh, does the physical exam match up with an upper neck injury? And then the final part is, are there symptoms that are consistent with an upper neck injury, headaches, dizziness, imbalance, or perhaps some of the autonomic problems that happen with craniocervical instability. So all of that has to point in the same direction, or most of it does, for us to come up with a firm diagnosis of symptomatic craniocervical instability. Now, doesn't mean that uh, all of those things are there all the time. We certainly have treated patients with three or four of those, uh, three of the four that have still done well, but we're just trying to increase the accuracy of a craniocervical instability uh, diagnosis. And then we get to the next level uh, above that, and that would be how do surgeons determine that diagnosis? And what I found is, is that it's interesting. Well, we're super strict on having those four things. Sometimes the surgeons tend to rely more on the imaging. Uh, now, the good ones have other tests that they try to put in there. Uh, sometimes that's invasive cervical traction and other things. Uh, but in general, I've noticed that our diagnosis of craniocervical instability tends to be a little bit stricter than most of the surgeons. Uh, and I think that surprises some people because they'll come in and, and they'll say, hey, I have craniocervical instability. The surgeon told me so. And I'll say, great, but I've got to get to my own uh, ability to check off all the boxes to make sure that that's actually happening. Uh, and I'm just going to double check something here real quick before we move on. Oh, good. We're starting to get some... Uh, some comments in. I just was trying to make sure that all this was happening since we're doing some really fancy things today. Uh, Mark Herbert uh, has a question here. Let me click on that and we'll show his question. Uh, how important is it to fast before a PRP or stem cell procedure? What could happen if someone didn't fast before the procedure? It would be okay to drink black coffee in the morning before the procedure. Yeah, Mark. Uh, when we ask people to fast, it's probably epigenetic. And what I mean by that is that there are certain people that have bad genetics, like me, I'm one of them, and who really don't respond well, for instance, to carbohydrates and sugars. Now, for those patients, uh, fasting is probably more critical. Uh, in addition, we want to lower the triglyceride levels in the sample. Now, for other people who have well-controlled sugars and well-controlled triglycerides, uh, fasting is probably less critical. So it really depends on what kind of patient you're, you are. If you're that kind of patient who has put on a lot of weight 
or some weight or has trouble controlling their weight after you get to middle age, uh, then fasting is probably going to be more critical for you. But if you've never had a problem with your weight, you can eat pretty much whatever you want. Uh, and you don't have any problem with your triglycerides, then fasting will be uh, less critical. So again, we put that blanket thing out there because we are trying to make sure that uh, we can control it, uh, but it doesn't necessarily apply to everyone equally because we're all different in our genetics. Uh, Submitted in advance by Charlene Tillman. Have you had patients who benefit from P PICL who were told they need an upper cervical fusion? Uh, yeah, Charlene, that's most of our, <coughs> excuse me, that's most of our existing patients right now, uh, meaning that the vast majority of our patients have been told they need an upper cervical fusion. So that's more common than not for us uh, in patients who get the PICL procedure. So important for you to, to realize that most of our patients who we treat have been told they need an upper cervical fusion of one type or another. <clears throat> uh, Laura, uh, hi there, I'm a repeat PICL client with uh, about 30% improvement in C1C2 overhang, 7.1 to 4.8 and 5.2 to 3.4 with three treatments. However, my C2 rotation one <clears throat> lateral side has increased from 14 to 30 is important. And what does that indicate? And how do you address the increased rotation? Yeah, probably not all that important. I mean, it all comes down to uh, the measurements, but also uh, more critically, how you're feeling. So if you're functionally feeling better, probably not as important. Now, what we have, what I have seen and something we could take a look at is some CCI patients that have had a lot of trauma can have almost like a fascial degloving injury where their, uh, their upper neck bones are no longer firmly attached to the surrounding fascia. And you can usually see that on the axial MRI. So what I'd recommend is that we take another look at your axial MRI and see if that's present. If it is, we may be able to tighten up one side of the fascia more than the other to see if that'll help that rotation. But again, most critical thing is, is obviously pain and function. Uh, submitted advanced by Eric Bowling, was just diagnosed with CCI. Is this procedure done at all Regenics clinics? Uh, no, it's definitely not done at all Regenics clinics. Uh, it's only Centeno Schultz uh, at this time and probably for the foreseeable future. Uh, so just Centeno Schultz in Colorado uh, right now. Uh, Sharon, Eric Centeno, if one doesn't show some ligament damage, but not much, passes physical physical test pretty well, but symptoms match with CCI, what do you decide? Uh, one doesn't show, not quite sure what that means, Sharon. Uh, maybe you can be more specific about what kind of ligament damage you have, and, and I might be able to answer better. Uh, Jackie, can people with dural leaks that were patched, the upper cervical docs for C1 adjustments? Um, well, if you have a dural leak that was patched and healed, then it shouldn't be a problem to see an upper cervical chiropractor for C1 adjustments. Uh, obviously, uh, how, how would you know your symptoms related to the dural leak would completely go away and would no longer be an issue? So that's probably the biggest thing to be concerned about there is if you're still having symptoms related to dural leak, then you're probably not going to want to get the upper neck adjusted. If those symptoms related to dural leak uh, have gone away, then that's something uh, that shouldn't be an issue. Stevie Ann Williams, after how many PICL procedures do you conclude uh, it's not working for someone? It can probably depend on each person, but can you give an average? Yeah, Stevie Ann, normally for me, uh, I will uh, tell patients that if they uh, really can't get uh, a some significant improvement with the first one, that we may do a second if we're absolutely convinced that's the diagnosis, but we're definitely not going to do a third. So I would want about two thirds of those patients or maybe half where we're not 100% sure about their diagnosis to not proceed with a second. And, uh, and if they do a second, 
because we're very, very, very sure they have a CCI diagnosis causing their symptoms. And if they're not getting any uh, improvement by that point, we're not doing a third. Uh, so Magda, uh, how long approximately does it take for the upper cervical to calcify after the injury? Not that long, but a lot of it would depend on age. So calcifications in tendons and ligaments tend to occur uh, more frequently in older patients rather than younger patients, and probably uh, in women more than men. Uh, but you know, in the order of a couple months uh, to a couple years, depending on which types of calcifications we're talking about, whether or not we're talking. So if we're talking about traction bone spurs or traction osteophytes, then the answer is, is uh, going to be shorter. And if we're talking about calcification within the body of the ligament, uh, longer. I think I've already answered that one for Sharon. Uh, Daniel, is sleep apnea caused by CCI? I got sleep apnea after my injury. Yeah, Daniel, interestingly enough, we've seen a very, very high prevalence of sleep apnea in our CCI patients. Now, we can generally know that just because they can be difficult uh, in that they can have mechanical apnea uh, during the procedure. And so we've noticed that in a lot of patients. So the good news is, obviously, with modern anesthesia, we can control for that. But it's definitely an observation that the two do seem to go hand in hand, and it makes some sense. There's some change of that posterior oropharynx area. So it may, in some patients, CCI may reduce the ability to move air through that uh, back of the throat area. Uh, I have head and cervical MRIs. How is that different from axial? Not sure what you mean there, Brendan. Um, axial just means a, a view like this. Uh, this is sagittal and this is coronal. So that's all axial means. It's just a type of view. Uh, Tata, I'm struggling to figure out how to get all the right imaging for the best review. I'm in the Bay Area and have access to great MRI facilities. The only DMX seems to be in upstate New York. Can you still get benefit from MRI to at least start the diagnostic process? You know, Todd, there's about 100 DMX units around the country. So DMX is all over the place, including California. Um, uh, if you want to get any MRI, I would say a good thing to start the process would be a functional upright MRI with flexion and extension. And uh, just to kind of review for everybody here, the least uh, likely for me to get to a diagnosis is a standard uh, cervical MRI. And then more likely to get to a diagnosis is an upright flexion extension movement. MRI and the most likely to get to a diagnosis is a DMX. Um, so uh, certainly possible that we may get to a diagnosis solely based on the cervical movement MRI where you're upright. Uh, so I'd probably start there, but realize we, uh, that we have about 100 MR or DMX centers around the country, not just upstate New York. Um, Sharon, I asked who was going to take it over from you if you retire. Yeah, no plans to retire uh, right now. Uh, Sharon, I'm just going to a different kind of schedule starting late summer. So starting late summer, I'll be doing four months on in the clinic and then two months off. But during that two months, I'll still be doing things like this. I'll still be uh, doing telemedicine, MPEs, etc. So not really retiring yet. Uh, but certainly, I, I can tell you before I retire, uh, we will show a number of people who have excellent skills uh, how to do this procedure and spend some time with them so they can do it competently. Uh, but right now, too early for that uh, at the moment. Uh, Pima Murphy, hi, I've yet to get PICL procedure, but I take or have advanced TMJ instability. When I relocate my jaw, my head posture alters. I'm concerned about whether I should ask, address the jaw instability before the neck instability. I feel the jaw being dislocated pulls at my neck posture. It might compromise the neck strengthening through the PICL. Is that something you've noticed with patients if they have jaw instability? Not so much, but the jaw and, this, and the upper cervical spine are certainly 
heavily correlated and related. So uh, it's certainly possible that treating the jaw is a good first step. I don't know your specific case, but I can say that that would make sense to me, uh, getting some high dose PRP injections, treating the uh, jaw ligaments to make sure that it dislocates less often would be a good thing to do prior to PICL. And we've also treated uh, quite a few patients where we've treated the, done the PICL and their jaw at the same time. And that seems to work as well. So uh, just go ahead and, uh, you know, you can do either. You can get this treated and then the, do the PICL or vice versa. Uh, Stevie Ann Williams, can PRP and PICL change occlusion? If yes, how does it change occlusion? Yes, yeah, Stevie, that's kind of uh, related to uh, Pima's question. You know, what happens more often than not in our experience is that once the upper neck gets injured, uh, other muscles jump in to try to stabilize the head on the neck. And the anterior strap mechanism, which is the jaw, the jaw muscles, all the muscles that come down here in the front of the neck, the omahyoid, the myohyoid, the sternocleidomastoids, all get in on the act of trying to stabilize the head on the neck. And the jaw tends to get overloaded and or change position because you're basically trying to stabilize your upper neck with your jaw. Uh, Todd Burke, uh, let me switch that over here. Is your recommended MRI recipe from 2008 still valid or has it been updated? You know, Todd, I, I, uh, if you're asking about a static upper neck uh, MRI, I, I wouldn't start there. I would, in fact, start with an upright movement-based MRI uh, and not the static life face up in a tube three Tesla MRI that I think you're talking about there. Uh, via van aspirin. I have convex spine with clipophile and transverse sinus narrowing 43 degrees of rotation, C1, C2, 11 degrees of C0 rotation, severe paresthesia. Who can help me? Um, you know, via van, I would need to look at all of your medical records and do a telemedicine evaluation to see if I can help you. Um, so I would encourage you to do a telemedicine eval. So I can look at all that information and, and really make my own uh, judgment on it. And then obviously go ahead and, and talk to you, uh, look at your history, et cetera. Uh, Smith Advance by Tricia Mann. How long uh, would I need to be in Colorado if I were to schedule a PICL? Does that have anything to do with severity of symptoms? You know, what we generally tell uh, patients is for the first trip here, if they're domestically traveling in the US, then we would like them to come in the night before. They, they'll get an eval, and then the evaluation uh, will be that next day in the morning. Uh, they would get a bummer aspiration, and then in the afternoon get the procedure. Uh, we want a domestic first-time traveler to be here at least one or two days after the procedure so that we can uh, provide help and have, see them back if needed. Uh, once you get more used to it, you can fly in and fly out. Um, now, for an international traveler, uh, we would recommend more time, two to four days here in the United States after the procedure, just because we want to make sure that they are okay to do that really big trip back home. Uh, Jackie, you said if blood patches don't work the first time, you would go to fiber and glue, follow by PRP. How do you determine if a patch is successful? How soon would you try again? Um, I don't recommend fibrin glue for blood patches. I know that's commonly done, uh, but I think PRP is a lot more powerful. So uh, a blood patch obviously is an epidural, just so everyone understands, is epidural uh, just injected uh, with blood and then the blood coagulates and it forms a patch. If that didn't work, we would use platelet-rich plasma and platelet-rich plasma uh, is more powerful in my experience than fibrin glue. So we don't use fibrin glue at all. Uh, Sharon, damage to the apical ligament AOM and ALL, what kind of instability would that cause? Uh, apical ligament could cause instability in a vertical direction. Uh, the AOM and, AL, AOM and ALL are anterior ligaments. 
So they would tend to cause too much motion in extension of uh, the skull base uh, one and two. Uh, Sharon Neeson, how is the aftercare? Um, not sure exactly what you mean, uh, Sharon, there, but uh, general aftercare for PICL would be to go back to what it was you were doing before. So, for example, if the patient got a lot of relief from upper cervical chiropractic, they can go back to doing that. If they get a, a lot of relief from intermittent use of a collar, they can go back to doing that. And, uh, and then obviously take intermittent medications if you've got a big flare up. If you don't, then don't take uh, any medications. And then we look at around the three to four month time frame to see how that patient's doing. CCI and AI diagnosis. I had an ultrasound of the neck carotid showing low flow and high pressure. And when sitting, highly abnormal waveform is correlating with symptoms, but no clinical explanation. Have you seen this pattern in other patients and what could be the cause? Yeah, P, a lot of that has to do, I mean, ultrasound imaging of the internal uh, jugular vein, which is what I think you're talking about, because um, we wouldn't really be talking about the neck carotids here. Um, uh, is an art form and is really can be interpreted very differently between two different texts that do it. Um, if we really wanted to see what was going on there, we could certainly do a CT venogram that shows the flow through the internal uh, jugular vein. And oftentimes if there's issues related to CCI, we'll see the atlas pushing on that vein. Um, and we have a lot of patients who have changes in blood flow through the internal jugular vein who have CCI. Jackie Jones, is there any benefit to injecting facet joints from C3 to T2 during a PICL from a stability perspective? If instability is shown in DMX and thought by the patient and subluxations there cause symptoms, muscle spasms and stagnus, but not pain. Jackie, uh, the facet joints don't provide much stability. Um, so injecting the facet joints should only be done if the facet joints themselves are causing pain. So that would mean that an examination showed that C3-4, uh, C4-5, C5-6, C6-7, C7-T1, T1-T2 facets were painful, and there was some specific reason to treat those. Uh, but we don't inject facet joints for stability. Uh, Todd, thanks so much for this session. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, if the moderators know the imaging center of the Bay Area, please let me know. You know, Todd, the best thing to do would be to reach out to Carla in my office, and she can give you a list of DMX places. Um, I'm just going to search it now, right? Uh, let's see what comes up. Looks, looks like there's one in Dublin, California. Yeah, you know, I think the best thing to do, Todd, would be um, there's a website, DMX Works, so DMX, W O R K S dot com. And I would, uh, I would go there, call those guys and ask them for a referral in the Bay Area. So DMX uh, works, W-O-R-K-S.com. Give them a call or reach out to them and uh, try to uh, ask them if they can make a specific referral in the Bay Area. Now, that's the manufacturer of the machine, so they should know who's got their machines out there. Uh, Camille, uh, O-L-D-A-K. Uh, hello, I'm from Poland. I was injured on, uh, on a sparring. I was diagnosed with instability of the upper spine. wonder if your clinic is available in Europe that performs any treatments. Uh, no, Camille, uh, nothing's available in Europe with regard to the PICL procedure um, at this time. Uh, Stevie Ann, can cervical spine anterolisthesis, rectalisthesis cause symptoms? I've been told that a C3-4 anterolisthesis on flexion. 
It's certainly possible, Stevie Ann, uh, during a PICL procedure, we treat those ligaments that can help reduce that motion in anterolisthesis, and that would be the supraspinous interspinous ligaments at C3, C4. So, um, so that could be causing symptoms, uh, but those ligaments at that level would routinely get treated anyway. Uh, Sharon, how do you determine if the problem is just posterior? Is uh, there some anterior? If there is some anterior damage, it doesn't mean that the problem is actually anterior. So, for example, if one has damaged the ALL, it may not cause symptoms. Uh, yes. So, just because uh, a ligament is loose doesn't mean that that's relating to what's causing the person's symptoms. That's why we always try to correlate that between the imaging, the physical exam, with what symptoms the patient's, patient has, et cetera. Uh, Connor, uh, my head feels like it's stuck in a chin tuck position. Uh, on my MRI, uh, the atlas looks like it's dropped anteriorly, uh, like my skull and C1 are lifted upwards posteriorly. Do you see this often? You know, we, we do. What could be happening there is some dislocation of the C01 joint, um, and that might uh, give that feeling of being stuck like this. Um, so yes, we have seen that. Uh, Jackie, thank you. Same question for PRP. How long would you wait before trying a dural patch again with PRP if blood did not work? Uh, for PRP, you're going to really be relying on that area to heal. So about a month should be a good amount of time. Uh, Sharon, after I mean from the Tenshields Clinic, do you touch base with patients frequently after procedure to see how it goes? Uh, sure, Sharon. I mean, all of my patients have my cell phone number and uh, my email address. So, you know, I may not hear from a specific patient uh, until uh, they're ready for follow up at around three or four months. Uh, the office will follow up sooner than that. And or I may exchange 20 emails with a patient like I did this last weekend uh, over three or four days. Uh, when they're having a specific issue. And then you know, at the end of that, the issue resolves and I probably won't hear from them again for a while. So, uh, but yes, if you've got problems, we are uh, communicating quite frequently, whether it be text or, or email. Pia, just to add, I it was the carotids and not jugular vein, but the IJ internal jugular vein is compressed by the transverse process to C1. Yeah, P.S. So uh, issues with the carotids wouldn't be related to CCI. They're too far away. But the internal jugular vein being compressed by the transverse process of C1, that would be more commonly associated with CCI. Uh, Becky, Dr. Centeno, I had a PRP procedure almost four weeks ago. I've had a very smooth response. Shoulder and neck, minor and no pain. I have minor bridge ligament issue, we believe, in addition to C2 rotation issues. We we're trying to manage conservatively. We injected the posterior minor, but not the bridge. Um, yeah, so when we inject the posterior minor tendon, it automatically injects the bidural bridge. Uh, Becky, so glad to hear you're doing well, but, uh, but the tendon uh, inserts into the bridge, meaning that these are all names of things. And I know they sound like different things because they have different names but they're all continuous structures. Uh, Sharon, can posterior laxity cause anterior damage or is usually anterior laxity that causes posterior damage? Uh, either can happen. Uh, Brendan, do you find tinnitus to be associated with compressed internal jugular veins? Not necessarily, Brendan. Um, tinnitus is, is not uncommon with CCI. Um, so it's a uh, pretty frequent finding, maybe uh, one in five to one in 10 CCI patients has tinnitus. Um, Becky, I'm experiencing CSF issues with a very typical movement that would cause my bridge. Ligament issues, should we inject the bridge? Yeah, Becky, uh, so just see my answer above. Uh, the bridge was injected, uh, so it's definitely... Uh, Definitely uh, something that got injected when we injected the tendon. Uh, and then thank you for your kind words there. Uh, 
Todd, um, Todd Burke, that was payback for any time I jokingly sent someone my, oh, okay. Uh, Pima, uh, thanks for answering my question. In addition to my injury about the jaw is, albeit I don't have the full understanding of the joint, can there be disc detachment that caused the jaw not being able to be relocated or another obstacle if the joint is worn down because of excessive relocation? How would these be approached? Would PICL still be a first option? Would the DMX be able to show these issues? Yeah, Pima, generally DMX isn't fantastic with jaws, although you can look at jaws on DMX. As you know, the, the, there are MRIs that can be done in an open and closed position, and that will help uh, with the concept of disc recapture. But realize when a, a jaw is doing what you're reporting, it's generally instability. So instability is due to loose ligaments. You tighten the ligaments, no more instability. So that, that's how that works. Uh, Sharon, why does an aspen vista cholera give relief? Is it because the muscles lack swollen in or is it the traction? Uh, could be either of those, but usually uh, cervical cholera, Sharon, uh, give uh, release because they're providing an artificial sense of stability. Just don't use the collar more than very infrequently because it will make the neck muscles very weak. Uh, this has been asked uh, before, but after PRP and also after PICL, are we required to wear a collar? Is it a soft or hard collar? No, Steve Yan, not required to wear a collar. The only time I'd recommend wearing a collar is if that patient has uh, great relief from the collar and has been using a collar intermittently. Then I'd recommend that they continue using it, but there's no need to get into a new collar. Can a misaligned atlas cause a right cranial torsion pattern? Um, there, you're going to have to ask a craniosacral specialist about that. I don't do craniosacral therapy myself, so that's something you'll have to ask a cranial uh, specialist about, meaning a, a craniosacral alternative medicine provider. Have you heard of PRI Physical Therapy, Postural Restoration Institute, and their cranial revolution course? Uh, you know, Ben, I haven't heard of that but I will look it up right now because um, always interested in trying to find really good providers. So I will take a look at that um, uh, at some point and let you know. I, I just brought it up. Uh, Carla Marie, how many CCI patients have you treated that have had severe symptoms such as non-epileptic seizures? Uh, dystonia episodes, EDS, passing out, pastas, I know they have mast cell gastroparesis. What are the, the success rate? Uh, pretty good number at this point. Um, as far as dystonic type episodes, uh, that's a less common one with CCI, but it's present. So personally, I've probably treated about five of those patients. EDS, about one in five of my patients has EDS, so that's a super common one. Passing out, again, less common, but probably treated about 20 or 30 of those patients through the years. POTS, about one in five of my patients has POTS. Dysautonomia, about one in five of my patients has dysautonomia. Mast cell, same thing. Gastroparesis, same thing, et cetera. Um, so, uh, but realize, Carla, that the lower level the patient um, the, the less likely the patient is to get back to a full recovery. So you, what you're describing is a fairly low level patient, uh, meaning low functional level. And, uh, you know, the good news is we can help those patients. Uh, the bad news is that's definitely not a patient that's going back to run a marathons. The goal is to get that patient to be able to, uh, have to lay down less and, and do things like that. Uh, Floyd, what ligament would you inject for C1-C2 subluxation with subluxable tenderness, tenderness, dizziness, and alar ligament ossification? Um, Floyd, I'd have to know a lot more than that. Um, so happy to, to take a look at that uh, in a telemedicine evaluation and to look, you'd have to have a DMX study so we can see uh, what's happening because when you talk about subluxable tenderness, tenderness, dizziness, uh, those are common things amongst almost all CCI patients. 
uh, C1C2 being out of place is also a super common thing. And then alar ligament ossification, I would have to take a look at what you're discussing there because uh, that could be a misinterpretation of what's going on. Uh, Sharon, if the eye, uh, internal jugular veins are not compressed with the transverse process C1 or elongated styloids or structures would likely be compressing it. Um, yeah, those are the two most common, uh, Sharon. Um, and we'd have to have some evidence that the IJVs were being compressed. So that's a, a diagnosis that's not trivial to make, meaning that you have to have an expert in CT venography to be able to capture that because uh, it's not easy to see. Uh, Pia, thank you. Do you think theoretically that compression of the IJV causing uh, cranial hypertension indirectly could cause the abnormal flow in the arteries uh, when there is high pressure in the brain? It's possible, Pia. Uh, it's not something we see very often with, with CCI, so that's a harder one for me to, uh, to answer. Um, thank you, Dr. Centeno. So if the mitral bridge is invaginating more frequently since injections almost four weeks ago, is that likely to improve with time? Um, yeah, Becca, the only way to tell if the mitral bridge is doing something would be with doing repeated uh, flexion extension MRIs, and those would have to be done using a protocol like Scott Rosa, where you're taking an MRI with different types of motion. So unless you've had that kind of motion, we really have no idea what's going on with the mitral bridge. Um, as far as whether or not, or as far as the time frame for tendon healing, uh, that's going to be three to four months. So in three or four months, we'll make a decision as to what's going on there. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, stoma, stomatonathic system and the jaw's effects on it? Haven't heard of that, Ben. I'd have to uh, look that one up. Uh, Sharon, uh, what if a patient's anatomy improves by PRP or PICL, but symptoms don't improve? Um, I think what you're referring to, Sharon, is the instability is improving, uh, but the symptoms aren't. Uh, so there's two possibilities there. One is we haven't improved the uh, instability enough, and we should keep on going. Uh, and we've done that in patients where we haven't seen much improvement of their symptoms, but we know that their overhang is getting better, so we will move on based with that information. Uh, now, it's also possible that the symptoms are being generated by something else, in which case we might do a diagnostic evaluation, uh, and that's where we go ahead and numb various structures to see if the symptoms go away. Um, and sometimes we can get there quickly, and sometimes that takes a while to numb the right structure to get all the symptoms to go away. Uh, Carla Bray, this is my 15-year-old daughter. Uh, gotcha. Uh, Sharon, which ligaments are responsible for an increase in translational BAI? Yeah, it could be lots of ligaments. Could be the apical dens ligament. Could be the anterior ligaments, like some of the ones you're talking about, inclus including this superficial AAOL ligament here between the atlas and the skull. Uh, could be the posterior ligaments, the AAOM, the PAOM, uh, nuchal ligament, et cetera. Uh, uh, gotcha. Uh, Brendan, is there a way to treat ligaments more toward the front of the neck, like the stylohyoid? Yeah, Brendan, we, we generally wouldn't want to treat the stylohyoid uh, ligament simply because uh, what you're probably talking about is some calcification of the stylohyoid. So that ligament is getting beat up usually because of the CCI, and then it's calcifying uh, because of that and making the uh, the styloid process look long. So in general, uh, we wouldn't treat stylohyoid at least uh, at first. We would treat the uh, CCI. Now, is it certainly possible that the stylohyoids impact uh, on the, the jaw and other anterior structures might need to be looked at? It's certainly possible. Um, Jay, I've had 24-7 occipital neuralgia headaches since 2015. Recently, they have transitioned from being sharp on its worst days to having more of a burning sensation. Any ideas what could be the cause? 
Yeah, Jay, normally when nerve pain switches more to burning, it just indicates that the nerve is kind of starting to give up the ghost, if you will. So I would I would say that that's probably not a great thing. Uh, so good idea probably to get all that looked at in more detail by an expert in that area. Uh, Floyd, uh, thank you, Doc. I was wondering if you know any place in Europe that does DMX. No one seems to know about that technology in France. The radiologist even laughed at me like I was crazy. Yeah, Floyd, we've not had much success in Europe uh, with DMX uh, to date. Uh, now, if you contact Carla, my assistant, there was one place uh, where we thought we might be able to get a little more information that was doing some something like a DMX. But, you know, if it were me, I'd probably just go to the uh, the London Upright MRI. Uh, let me look that up for you. Let's see here. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Uh, Med, uh, Med Serena Upright uh, MRI Center of London uh, on Cromwell Road in Kensington is the center that we've seen uh, do some of the best uh, upright CCJ imaging in Europe. So I think that's a great place to start uh, to try to get uh, some better images and probably, you know, not crazy far from where you are and then it's just across the channel. And obviously you can you can take the train. Um, so that's probably where I would start if I were in France. Uh, Joe Henry Muno. So a patient goes to see you for a consult. Do you also image the IGV involvement while they visit Colorado? Would you like image done prior? And if so, what type of doctor would be best for that? You know, Joe Henry, since the internal jugular vein involvement is secondary to the instability, it's not something we really need to see imaged. Uh, unless we believe that there's some independent cause of the internal jugular vein involvement. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to treat the CCI and see if that goes away. Now, if you really want to get it imaged, it's a CT venogram, which would be probably the most accurate way to take a look at it. And a CT venogram uh, could be done by just a large uh, hospital. Uh, the trick is usually trying to make sure you get the right CT slices to go through the transverse process of C1, and then uh, trying to make sure that you can see the entire internal jugular vein. You know, the problem always is that if you inject into a vein, uh, it's only in that vein for a few seconds. So you have to take the picture uh, while uh, it's the contrast can be seen in, in the internal jugular vein. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist, but it certainly uh, will take someone who's done them before and understands what it is we're trying to do. Um, uh, question number four from Carla Marie. She was having 60 plus dystonic seizure activity until getting diagnosed and getting an aspen cervical collar on. Yeah, so Carla Marie, if she was having a lot of uh, dystonic activity until she got into a cervical collar, that would argue for the idea of CCI. Then you'd obviously have to get other things as well uh, that all line up in that direction. So a physical exam that lines up in that direction, imaging that lines up in that direction. Uh, some reason why the CCI is there, meaning trauma, EDS, uh, et cetera. If I remember your uh, past statements, it sounds like she has EDS, so that part's there. So the next part would be a physical exam and imaging in order to uh, get there. Ben, do you have a guess as the amount of time it takes for a misaligned atlas to start affecting the jaw? Uh, tough question to answer, uh, Ben. Uh, you know, that could be immediately could be months, hard to say. Uh, Brendan, uh, yeah, it's calcified. Yeah, Brendan, I just would need to take a look at the images myself in order to better understand exactly what you're trying to relay. Uh, Sharon, can the skull actually sink? Uh, it, it can to a certain degree. We've seen a few patients, um, I would say 5% of our CCI patients that have what I call pumpkin head meaning the, the head 
has kind of uh, sagged uh, a bit and they are more difficult to treat because structurally they have uh, a bigger set of uh, issues and it's hard uh, to get the needle to go where we want it to go. But that's thankfully only about 5% of the patients we look at right now. Uh, afternoon, what are your thoughts on using uh, adenaryl to improve the cervical uh, curve when one has a military neck? Is it okay to use after PICL? Yeah, I always tell patients when it comes to curve restoration, um, you, what you really want to do is to, if you've got adenaryl, uh, get on that in a very gentle way and see if it improves your symptoms. If it improves your symptoms or it doesn't aggravate your symptoms, then you're good to go and use it very, very carefully. If it does aggravate your symptoms, then you really can't use it uh, uh, until you're, you're cleared. Uh, but if you want to self-clear it, just see which category it's in. Uh, is it worth to get a CT vinogram if you're going to treat the CCI the same way either way? Generally not, Brendan. You know, one of the concerns about CT scans in general is that they're an immense amount of uh, X-ray radiation. Um, so the average CT scan has about 100 chest X-rays worth of radiation. So I try to keep patients away from CT scans. So I would say no, I wouldn't get a CT venogram uh, unless there's some uh, real pressing reason to do so. Uh, Stevie Ann Williams, I'm hoping to come over for a posterior PRP and then PSCL late UK summer. I have three year old and autistic son I care for. Uh, are we able to get back to normal activities after the procedure? Should we uh, rest more than usual? Stevie Ann, that really depends on the patient. You know, I have patients who don't even know I did a procedure, I had one of those last week. Uh, they're pretty convinced I didn't do anything even though we injected 20 sites and I've got patients who have severe flare-ups afterwards. Most people are in the middle, uh, meaning they have sort of three to 10 days of flare-up. Uh, so it really depends on which category you're in. If you're one of those patients who um, is on the light side of flaring up, meaning you know, a couple days of soreness, then I think you can get right back to your normal type of care what you couldn't be doing is a lot of lifting during that time. So if you've got to lift your three-year-old autistic son a lot, then you're definitely going to need some help, at least for the first eight to 12 weeks um, in lifting your son. Uh, Terry Turner, uh, DO, does an incredible job of cervical manipulation. Eureka, California, best hands I've had on me. Uh, great to hear. Uh, Sharon, is there a way to decrease a dowager's hump? Best way to decrease a dowager's hump is not to get one. Um, hate to say it that way, but um, you really need to be working on that stuff for years um, to prevent it from happening. So if you already have a dowager's hump, you can certainly work to open up the chest, open up the psoas in the pelvis, um, do some Swiss ball work. Um, but once a dowager's hump forms, there are changes in shape of the vertebra. And because of that, it gets baked in. So the best way to, uh, to treat a dowager's hump is to avoid one in the first place, which means uh, aggressive stretching uh, against a dowager's hump for, for many, many years um, to prevent that from happening. Uh, why does one get worse after car rides, even wearing a hard collar? Yeah, Sharon, the biggest thing about car rides, boat rides, et cetera, um, if you're the passenger, is you never really know when that next, where that next bump is going to come from. And if you've got CCI, you don't have the musculature that's turned on up there to protect things, and the ligaments aren't working either. So it's a very common thing to hear from patients that, uh, that car rides are particularly difficult. Um, Pia, the question about sinking head and more difficult to treat, are you thinking about cranial settling or is that a different beast? No, uh, Pia, talking about cranial settling, but I wouldn't have the same definition that the surgeons do there. I'm really talking about the more severe cases of cranial settling and or that's how the patient was born. Um, because we need to be careful here, uh, unless we've got MRIs or, or X-rays throughout the person's life, uh, for some of these patients that we call, quote, cranial settling, they were born that way. 
Um, Sharon, I can feel a scary pulsating pressure in the odontoid area. What could that be? Uh, could be internal jugular vein related, uh, but I would need to know a lot more, Sharon. I, I, again, I'd, I'd recommend uh, a telemedicine about that issue. Happy to, to take a look at it. Okay, we are at 150, and I do have a hard stop in about five minutes. So if you guys have any other questions I can answer, happy to answer those. Again, like to host questions just to make sure that everyone uh, stays on the same page, everyone's knowledgeable. Uh, Stevie Ann Williams, thanks for confirming. I want to make sure I don't lift. What about turning our heads and looking up and down? Should we avoid this after a procedure? No, uh, Stevie Ann, um, no, no, no reason to avoid the things that you currently can do um, after the procedure. So if you can currently do those things, then it's not an issue. Uh, what do you mean the muscles aren't turned on for CCI patients? Mine always seem turned on tightly like they are forming a cast around my spine. Yeah, Brendan, uh, so we're talking about the paradox here of spasm uh, and instability. What I mean by that is that in uh, CCI patients, or really any instability patient, the muscles uh, can spasm and they spasm to try to protect the area. Now, when they're spasming, the good news is they are protecting the area. The bad news is they're not doing a great job of protecting the area, meaning that your muscles are constantly pre-contracting with motion to protect your spine. So for instance, if I go reach for this thing on my desk here, uh, 100, uh, hundredth of a second uh, before I do that, the the muscles in my spine are pre-contracted now if they're spasming all the time that doesn't happen so while they will still protect the joints to some degree they're not doing a great job of of it and they're not working like they're supposed to so while the muscles may be spasming when we take an mri of your upper neck we routinely see that those the, the bigger stabilizing muscles that are supposed to be protecting things are atrophied and are actually smaller. So the muscles that you're feeling are the big muscles and not the short segmental muscles that are supposed to be stabilizing. Uh, thank you, Pia, for your kind words. Uh, Gina Marie uh, Anderson, if, if someone is very reactive and sensitive to everything due to MCS, is the procedure safe? Yeah, Gina, we certainly have patients who have uh, mast cell disorder, um, macrophage activation syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at this point, if there's any questions, uh, I would recommend that that patient get uh, just skin wheel tested for all the things we'll be using in the procedure. Uh, so that would be anticoagulants, um, anything that you might get exposed to, like an anesthetic, uh, contrast, et cetera. And that's the same skin wheel testing that would be done an allergist office where we inject a little bit of that stuff under the skin, uh, make a mark there, and then try to uh, to figure out if you're sensitive to those things. Uh, the answer is generally no, but if you're, there's any concern on your part, uh, let's do those skin tests. Uh, Sharon, uh, if one didn't benefit from, C C from C0 C2 fusion at all, would it still make sense to a PICL? No, Sharon, once the fusion is done, that, that ship has sailed and, and it ain't turned around. Jackie, have you and Dr. Schultz started injecting the mitral bridge like you spoke about a few weeks ago? Uh, yeah, Jackie, I've been injecting it. Yeah, uh, certainly done probably 100 mitral bridges. So yes, uh, I've been injecting the mitral bridge uh, on anyone that, that has rectus capitis posterior minor issues or where it looks like there's a dural invagination at the insertion of the myodural bridge. Uh, Aisling Murphy Wall. Um, uh, Daniel, when moving my eyes around, I feel weird uh, feeling uh, back around the posterior ligament or anything like this. Yeah, Daniel, when you move your eyes, you're activating those upper cervical muscles. So you may just be uh, feeling some of the instability from the activation of those muscles. Jackie, with a nasal fluid leak that lasted a few days, stopped and reappeared a few weeks later, and also stopped, indicative of a CSF leak, and enough for you to treat with a blind patch. 
Um, yeah, Jackie, these all fluid leaks are skull. Well, number one is you'd have to make sure that that is CSF. Um, uh, and usually that's diagnosed with what's called a pledget test. Um, and you're talking about a skull base dural leak, and that's not something we can patch. We would spec patch spinal leaks, and that's usually a skull base surgery. Now, there's an excellent um, uh, skull base surgeon here, Dr. Hepworth, uh, that uh, can do that kind of pledget test, um, but we don't do blood patches for, for skull base. Just spinal. Uh, Sharon, can you recommend any medications that can ease symptoms a bit until we get treated? Yeah, Sharon, that, that requires a diagnosis. So the answer is no. Um, okay, guys, thanks so much. Uh, it's 1.55. I've got a hard stop. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to be interested to see if this uh, was able to broadcast to all three channels. I think if it did, then that's what we'll start doing again. That way, regardless if you hit the Regenix page, if you hit the Centennial Schultz page, you hit the YouTube channel, it'll be on that channel. So we'll see how that goes. So everyone have a fantastic week. Thanks so much for all your great questions. And uh, if you uh, have any additional questions, you can leave them below. And uh, Carol, our Facebook person, will carry those over to uh, the next session. Uh, this Friday, I won't be here uh, because I'll be traveling. And uh, but I will be back uh, on this coming Monday and then probably the following Friday. So have a great week. Thank you.